Hey, Norfolk you Online, I cannot believe that it has been a year since we have been together as an online church, and it has been awesome to see how God has been moving over the last 12 months, giving us this opportunity to stay connected, to stay together as one body of believers worshiping our Lord, and we are grateful for you. We are grateful for how you have continued to plug in each and every week and to experience worship with us and to listen to messages and to take your next steps in your relationship with Jesus. And we are here to stay. We are excited about this next 12 months and how God is going to move through these services to give you an experience with the Lord to help you take your next steps. Now, I am excited to just welcome you. So we are glad that you are here. Why don't you turn your volume up and stand up and worship with us? Oh, we look to the sun, set our eyes on our Savior, see the image of love, sing His praises forever. Tearing through the dead of night See the kingdom burst in the color that the speed of light Freedom shaking up the atmosphere As the shadow fades and nothing as the day appears Beyond the skies above, but reaching out for us, the everlasting one, Jesus our God. Oh, we look to the sun, set our eyes on our Savior, see the image of Kingdom come See the hope of heaven Shining like the rising sun Now forever Lifted up from death to life There's no fear in love And no darkness in his endless light Beyond the sky Reaching out for us, the everlasting one, Jesus our God, beyond the skies of
wasn't for nothing that you shed your blood So I'm gonna live like my shame is gone I won't be shackled to the way I was and I'm gonna live like my chains are gone Hey church, I want to let you know about our Good Friday experience on April the 2nd from 8 a.m. until 8 p.m. We are going to have a self-guided uh, worship experience for you to think about, meditate, and pray through the cross experience that Jesus went through so that you and I could take a next step in getting closer to God and understanding his sacrifice and what that means for us in our lives. Now, what this will look like is at 8 a.m. we'll begin a self-guided service. You will walk in and there'll be different prayer prompts and different things taking place on the screens so that you could have a, a personal experience uh, with Jesus. And that prayer experience will begin every hour from 8 a.m. until 8 p.m. This is a great time for you to come maybe by yourself. Maybe you would bring your small group together or your family, whatever that might look like. We're excited to be able to give you this opportunity this upcoming Good Friday to experience that. Now, also, I wanted to let you know, a couple days after Good Friday is our Easter services. And on April the 4th, we cannot wait to be able to have an Easter service in this room. And those services are going to be at three different times. And these are different times than what you and I are used to. So go ahead, write these down. We're going to have a service at 8 a.m., at 9.30 a.m., and at 11 a.m. And the exciting thing about that is there's going to be plenty 
plenty of space for us to gather in a safe way to be able to worship and celebrate the resurrection. And we hope to see you guys there for that. Hey, good morning, Northview. It's so good to connect with you online. Today is our one-year anniversary of our online campus. It was one year ago this weekend uh, that I sent out an email that I never, ever, ever thought that I would send out saying that we are going to be closing our doors indefinitely to large gatherings, and we are going to be exclusively online for a period of time. That was a moment where we, uh, as a church, as leadership and staff, had to scramble a bit. We had to uh, get creative, and it pushed us in, an, in a way that we needed pushed, uh, frankly, to get some things done that we had talked about doing and had wanted to do for a very, very long time. And it forced us to get our online presence established once and for all. And I know that this has been a crazy year, uh, but one of the things that I am most grateful for for this entire process has been the presence online that we've been able to get rooted and established uh, for our church. You know, there's so many markers as we come through this uh, early March period that probably many of you are reflecting on and remembering where you were and what was going on uh, in your life and time a year ago at this point. We reflect back at pictures and events and, and, and we long for those, those times when we could all be gathered uh, around each other a little more freely. We're, we're seeing, as we talked about last week, more and more people begin to return to our in-person services and, and we're so delighted for that. We're grateful for that. We're grateful for what God is doing. But at this one year mark, I do want to just kind of draw some attention to the fact that I know this has been a subject that we're tired of hearing and tired of talking about, but it's been our reality. It's been the world's reality for a year. And uh, for a year, we have uh, really scratched and clawed and had to fight for daily life and to fight for community. And this link that we have has been a special part of that. And so we're grateful for it, that even in this tough season, that we've been able to, to connect with people through it. We've been able to mourn with those who mourn and, and weep with those who weep. We've been able to rejoice with those who've rejoiced during this time. We've been able to, to walk together, even if that means doing so digitally or from a little bit more socially distanced than before. But nonetheless, it certainly feels like we're turning a major corner on this and we're moving forward in very, very significant ways. You know, as a church, we are, it feels like the clutch is going in and we are just about to shift a gear and uh, the, the momentum is building and the excitement is building. The summer camp season and, and things that are shaping up for the later part of the year are, 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 are right around the corner and, and they're pressing in on us in a way that makes us feel like, yeah, things are about to change. Things are getting closer to reality again back to normal again. And we're thankful for that. We're thankful for what that means. Uh, we're, we're excited that groundbreaking is right around the corner on the center, this expansion of our, of our facility where this vision to realize our, our place as a, a place for community, for the community, a place where, where sports and arts and, and coffee and children's play and many, many other activities can become uh, can become a reality and, and that these bridges relationally can be built to people. We can experience life together in a powerful way. We've got a meeting next weekend at both of our services that's uh, an important congregational meeting where we'll unpack more details about that timeline and vision and, and, and everything. And so I, I would love for you, as many as possible, to be a part of that next Sunday. 
Uh, That's exciting, what's ahead. And and I think as we begin to think about life on the other side of this pandemic, I don't know about you, but you start to think about the kind of things you've been missing, the kind of things you've been wanting to do. I kind of wonder if you've got a short list uh, of things that you want to do or places that you want to go on the other side of this, like almost like a post-pandemic bucket list. What's on your list? Where are the places when everything is kind of calm again and it's free to move, we're free to move around and travel wherever we want to go? Where are the places that you are wanting to go? Maybe it's something uh, overseas in Europe or something that you've always thought about doing. And once everything in, in, is in the clear, I wonder if there's a sense of urgency for you to book that trip and to get that experience before it's too late. Maybe you're trying to get to one of the coasts or somewhere exotic or maybe to a big city. I know right now that doesn't sound very appealing to me, but in time it might be appealing again. And and I bet there's a bucket list. I bet even before this pandemic, there was a, a group of cities or places or destinations that you at some point in your life wanted to make sure that you got a chance to see with your own eyes and experience fully, not just on TV or in a photograph, but in real life. You know, that's one of the things that kind of unites us as people in in all places and at all times. Those type of thoughts and feelings, desires to go and see and experience and go play. It's it's always been there. It's always been a part of of who we are. It's part of the human experience. And, you know, uh, when we talk about bucket list trips and we talk about the kind of place or experience that someone would long to go that might be a once in a lifetime trip, Um, there's a bucket list trip in the Bible uh, that we're going to look at today that was taken by a guy named Simon. He's known as Simon of Cyrene. And his bucket list trip was a trip from uh, Africa, from Cyrene to Jerusalem for the week uh, of Passover to experience something that he had heard of, something that he had longed for, something he had always wanted to see and experience but had had to do so uh, from afar for so many different years. I mean, Simon is, is, a, is a guy who, admittedly, he's a guy who was forced to become famous. He didn't really ask to become famous. I mean, a lot of people through the ages have worked very hard to get their names in the pages of history. But Simon of Cyrene was not one of those guys. He was someone who was just pushed into the pages of history without his consent. He was just trying to take his bucket list trip. And in the middle of that trip, the unthinkable happened. If it wasn't for this one event in the middle of this bucket list trip, he would have never been known. This one experience was so significant. It was so powerful because it connects to Jesus as he's on the way to the cross. You know, this series that we're in right now called Vantage Point, the the idea behind the series was we were going to take a look at the crucifixion of Jesus through the eyes of some minor characters that are in Luke chapter 23 who all were witnesses and who were very close in proximity to Jesus at this moment. We're going to try to look through their eyes and look through their perspective and see what they saw so that we take in this most important moment in human history. We have maybe a new level of perspective by seeing it through their own eyes. Uh, Simon uh, again, is, is found in Luke 23. If you have your Bibles, uh, go ahead and turn there. Luke tells us that, that he had just got in uh, from traveling from Cyrene. Uh, at that time, this is probably Libya today. He, uh, we're talking about a thousand miles or so. If you were a, a Jewish person living in Cyrene, you're probably about a thousand miles from the center of all this action and life in Jerusalem. And, and remember, we, we, we got to get out of our modern world here. Um, they didn't have social media. You couldn't follow hashtag Passover feast from afar. You didn't have the internet to go get a picture or videos on YouTube that you could watch. You couldn't click a Zoom link and see everyone who was there. All you could do was imagine it in your mind's eye from the stories that you've heard or maybe the descriptions in art from other people. That was all you really, that was all you really had. They didn't have very good transportation like we have now either. There were trains and planes and automobiles. So to get there, I mean, this would have been an expensive and very, very long thing. Uh, many, many people like Simon, many foreign Jews would have dreamed of a day where they could have saved up enough money and made it one time, this once-in-a-lifetime pilgrimage to Jerusalem to see it all firsthand. 
you know, again, you, you've, you've pictured those bucket list places. For a Jew, this was the spot. For Jewish people spread all over the ancient world to be able to come and see Herod's temple in, in person, to be there for the great Passover feast. This was the dream of dreams, and here he is. This is Simon getting to live that dream. He's taking it all in. And if you've ever had uh, any kind of international travel experience or you're going to some big famous historic site like the Colosseum or the Eiffel Tower or something like that, um, you, you know this feeling. It's that moment that you're finally there. And you're going to see a lot of things. You're going to experience a lot of things on the way. But you're finally seeing it with your own eyes. And you've got a destination in mind. You've got a couple of landmarks that you cannot wait to see with your own eyes. You can't believe to see it. It's almost surreal. You've seen pictures. You've seen videos. And here's Simon, wide-eyed, ambitious, probably with a whole lot of things to see and do and that he's got planned. He's on his way to the temple to make a sacrifice, but before he can get there, he hears this loud wailing processional coming down the street. And as it gets louder, he could have never imagined what happens next. You see, Jesus is on the Via Dolorosa on the way to the cross. Jesus is carrying this cross through the streets of, of Jerusalem on his way to Golgotha. This was the, the tradition uh, with crucifixion, is that the condemned criminal would, would have to uh, carry their cross to their place of execution. Uh, many times they would carry the entire cross. There's different depictions of this that you'll see. If it was a lighter version of a cross, they would maybe carry both uh, the vertical and the horizontal piece. If it was more of the heavier constructed cross, they would typically just carry the horizontal piece that their arms would be attached to. And then once they got to the crucifixion site, the horizontal piece would be attached to the, uh, to the vertical uh, for, to the vertical beam. But part of this humiliation of, of crucifixion was tied to this public parade as a criminal was mocked and scorned and the crowd watched in horror as a, as a reminder to never get on the wrong side of Rome. Jesus, when he came down that road carrying that cross, he was already in critical condition. Remember, Pilate had ordered that Jesus be flogged. He was trying to avoid crucifixion. He was trying to avoid killing Jesus. He didn't think Jesus deserved to die. The religious leaders in the crowd were pressing him to go ahead and go through with this. He thought, I'll beat him within an inch of his life and they'll have compassion and they'll relent and they'll say, okay, okay, that was good, that's enough. But they didn't. And so he did this torturous beating to Jesus. And then also, crucified. Jesus is coming down the road in terrible, terrible condition. After taking these whips from the, from, from, from the cat of nine tails, he would have wounds that would be comparable to shotgun wounds, to being shot with a gun. I mean, just bleeding and in and, 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 and shock, body in shock. It's no wonder that he was struggling at this moment. And he's not even made it yet to the cross. He's not even made it to the cross. Once on the cross, he would suffer even more difficulty. But while Jesus is struggling to carry his cross to Golgotha, a crowd gathers and watches on the street. Many watched with horror, openly wept for him as they see him struggle, as they see him. And, and so it's this crowd's vantage point. And, and, and Simon is in this crowd that I want to try to pick up in Luke chapter 23 verse 26. It says, as the soldiers led him away, and this is Jesus, they seized Simon of Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country. And he put on him, put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. And a large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. In the blink of an eye, Simon's plans and his dreams and his whole itinerary and his whole view of what this bucket list trip is going to look like, it's all thrown out the window. And his life and his legacy are forever altered because he was forced to carry this heavy and blood-stained cross of Jesus. The, the, the Romans had a law called the law of conscription, and it meant that you could ask someone to carry anything that they deemed as reasonable load for one mile. And you had to do it. It was, it, was, it was just the law. You couldn't reject it. You had to do it. 
Simon was forced in this moment to assist. But, but, but i got to get this Jewish perspective on this because it's more than just helping someone out. You've got to understand that there's a risk here for Simon. I mean, Jesus was so beaten in this, in this moment. He was so bloodied. He was so bruised. Isaiah chapter 52 verse 14 says that his face was so disfigured he hardly seemed human. And from his appearance one would scarcely know that he was a man. Most Jews would consider anyone, even a Jew, who is being crucified, they are cursed by God. And to touch him or to touch the wood that touched him, this, this association would be, this would make Simon unclean. Here's why this matters. This blows up the whole reason he came to Jerusalem. The whole reason he came to Jerusalem was to be able to see the temple, experience the temple, make sacrifice at the temple. And he's not going to be able to do any of that because he's now going to be unclean. In this moment, it's all being taken from him. He's traveled all this way. He's traveled all this way. And that which he came to do has been taken out from him. Why the soldiers picked Simon? I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, the, the traditional viewpoint is that Jesus stumbles right in front of him. And, and many believe that maybe he stepped out and showed some sympathy and, uh, and tried to help. And then the, the soldier said, here, okay, sure. If you want to be helpful, carry the cross and forced him to do so. I, I think that it's not hard to believe that maybe they caught eyes, Jesus and Simon, at some point in this, in this, in this drama. And those eyes and that power that was in his eyes grabbed a hold of him and drew out his compassion. We know that Jesus had the ability with even just a look to move people deeply. Simon then takes this cross that Jesus will in moments be nailed to and he carries it for him, walking behind him all the way to the cross. I don't know what was going through his head in those moments, I don't know what he was wrestling with internally. I don't know if he felt like he was in a dream and it didn't even seem real. I know that because he had just traveled in from, the, from, from far away, he had never had a chance to hear Jesus teach. He didn't understand a whole lot about who Jesus was or what he had stood for or the kind of messages that he had spoken. If he had been around Jesus before this moment, I'm sure he would have heard Jesus say this because this was Jesus's most repeated statement. Luke chapter 9, verse 23, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. Jesus was speaking in some ways metaphorically as he repeated this over and over and over again. Some experienced it quite literally. Tom, or Simon is certainly one of those. And this, this message is clear. This message is clear. To follow Jesus is to accept an interruption into your previously scheduled life and any other vision that you have in life and to change. I guess if I could just say it clearly, it's one of the things I appreciate about Simon's story so much is it highlights this idea that Jesus equals life interruption. It's, it's, it's not Jesus fitting into the side, on the side of my previously thought through and worked through vision of life. It does not work. This is, we interrupt the previously scheduled programming to bring you this alert. This is the way of Jesus. He doesn't fit into your plans. He doesn't fit into your budget. He doesn't fit into your self-absorbed views of, of the future. He interrupts you right in the middle of it right in the middle of it, and you think this is the way life is going, and you think this is what life is about, but when he meets you, he interrupts you, and you can't fit him into your box, and you can't fit him into your plans. He interrupts your life in the fullest and sometimes most humiliating of ways. With Jesus, it's all in, and you have moments where moments mean the, the different in, 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 a, in a movement pattern that's going to change your entire life trajectory. 
You cannot put him on this side. He wants to interrupt you and your entire life. It's one of the most powerful realities of Jesus that I think too many people miss. I think one of the biggest things that, that people miss about Jesus is, is they think they got him. And they think they understand him. And they think they can control him or that they can take what they know about him and safely keep it tucked away. Maybe even close to their heart. I see many of his followers that do this with him. But all he cares to do is completely flip you upside down and interrupt you in the most challenging, often humiliating types of ways. However, on the other side of it, on the other side of it, on the other side of turning everything upside down, it becomes the most glorious and beautiful and incredible things. In the moment where Simon is carrying the cross of Jesus, everything about his trip and probably everything about his faith is being blown up in a moment. On the other side of it is this most beautiful, beautiful transformation. What we know from this moment is that this moment changed him. It changed him. And that's what the cross moment does. It's what happens. And that's why we speak about the idea that the best vantage point to see God and to see his love is from the cross. And when you see God from that vantage point, it changes you. It interrupts you. It's, it's messy. And it's, and, and it's awful. And it's horrible. And it's a reminder of what it is that caused that to happen. It's our sin, my sin, your sin, that put Jesus on that cross. Simon's sin put Jesus on that cross. Jesus willingly bore it. But as a follower of his, he invites us, like he did for Simon, to carry that cross. And to live that same kind of life. And knowing that in losing our lives that we will actually find that very thing that we've been searching for this whole time. This was an interruption of plans on the grandest scale, but this interruption changed Simon's entire life. And not just his life, it changed his entire family's life and their entire destiny. Mark tells the same story uh, of Jesus' crucifixion and this walk and this moment where Simon is forced to carry the cross, except he highlights that this was Simon who was the father of Alexander and Rufus. Now, now, why would Mark even tell us that and tell us the name of these boys if Simon just disappeared after the crucifixion and was never heard of again? It's clear that this specific Simon and his specific boys have some status or have some level of popularity or people know who they are in their communities. There'd be no point in giving them these names and highlighting this otherwise. This means that the sons of Simon were well-known Christians in Rome. This is who this book was written to. This is confirmed by Paul in his letter to the Romans when he says in, in chapter 16, verse 13, greet Rufus, eminent in the Lord, and his mother of mine. Where did this incredible Christian family come from? Well, Paul hadn't even been to Rome when he wrote this letter, so he must have been with them before he moved to Rome. Here's my thought process here. Simon of Cyrene likely was the first convert in Africa and went back home with that new faith and won his family to Christ. From there, they moved to Antioch. Antioch is is in Acts chapter 13, uh, the place where kind of the, the hub of Christianity and the base of all these missionary journeys that Paul launches from are centered around there. The, the, the followers of Jesus are first called Christians in Antioch. And it's there in Acts 13 that we get this reference where we see Simon and Lucius of Cyrene. He was the first convert at the cross. He became a leader in Antioch, where believers were first called Christians. It would be here that Paul would get to know him and his family, and later be able to speak of them when they moved to Rome. And there's so much that we don't know. There's so much that we don't know about this family. But what we do know is that this moment where Simon carried the cross marked them. It changed them. Simon was compelled to bear the cross for a while by the soldiers but he bore it willingly for the rest of his life because of what he experienced himself in his encounter with Jesus. 
Simon came to Jerusalem one way, and he left another. Before Simon met Jesus, he had religion. After he met Jesus, he had a Savior. And the difference between the two can't be understated. Simon had come to Jerusalem with a purpose that was completely different, but he encountered Jesus and everything changed. You know, I have to believe that maybe there's a Simon watching right now. Maybe you've jumped on the internet for a totally different purpose and you stumbled across this message. You don't even know why you're watching. You don't just happen to tune into this. God intended to interrupt your life. He intended to interrupt your life in the most beautiful way by introducing you to the love that he has for you through the sacrifice of his son Jesus on the cross. He did this for you. And in the same way that he looks or looked at Simon, he looks at all of us and he invites us to be his followers, to deny ourselves, to pick up our cross and to follow him. Knowing that even though it feels and the experience at times feels like death, that there is new life on the other side of it. Simon's vantage point reminds us that what feels like an interruption may be an intervention. It may be God in this season or in this day finally grabbing a hold of you and grabbing a hold of your attention and saying, life as you know it is over. I've got a better way to live. I've got a better plan for you. And if you're hearing God right now interrupting you and interrupting your life in that way, I pray that you, like Simon, will allow this to happen and that you will pick up that cross and that you will follow Jesus wherever he leads you. Trusting that he's not interrupting you to make your life uncomfortable for no reason. But with your best interests in mind, he has a plan. He has a goal. He has a vision for your life that your self-absorbed interests could never, could never embrace. So let go of you and reach out to all that God has for you in his son, Jesus. What feels like humiliation may not actually be such. It may be what leads to redemption. I know sometimes when we come to these moments and we come face to face with Jesus and his cross and the sacrifice that he made and we see that beaten body and we see that blood that was shed and we recognize that it was our sin that caused that. It leads us to a place of great shame and great humiliation. But the goal and the intention for God is that it would be his kindness that is seen, and that it would be our redemption that would be bought, and that it's through that that we would see and live a life worthy and honoring of what God has done for us in his son, Jesus. So today, I want to provide you an opportunity to respond to Jesus. Like Simon responded to Jesus, a moment to step out of a crowd and to be identified individually as one of his followers to say I'm with you and I will follow behind you wherever you lead I'll carry this cross I will walk with you on this journey because you have saved my life I lay down religion I lay down trying to earn my way to God I need a savior if that's where you are and you're ready to receive Jesus Christ as Lord our online hosts right now are reaching out and opening up opportunities for conversation and prayer. We hope you take this step, and we hope that you allow this interruption in your previously scheduled plans to open up the most beautiful life imaginable. Say yes to Jesus. Say yes to Jesus. Open up every part of who you are, and allow him to lean in and to guide every step of who you are. Be fully obedient to where he wants you to go. Allow your life publicly to be seen as a follower of Jesus. Identify with his baptism. Identify with his death, burial, and resurrection. And give full devotion. Give full devotion in your life to all that God has for you. Here's what Simon's story teaches me. It reminds me that Jesus equals interruption, and I need to have my eyes open more frequently 
to what God is actually doing and where he is actually moving and not just where I think he will or where I want him to. Is my heart, are my eyes, are my ears, am I ready for interruption? Am I ready for takeover? Am I ready for Jesus today to paint a new version of today and tomorrow and the weeks ahead than I have planned in my mind? That is at the essence of following Jesus. He's the leader I'm the follower. Wherever he goes, I will follow. Interruptions are actually interventions. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you and we worship you. And from this viewpoint of Simon, Lord, we see just what lengths you will go to break through and break into our lives how you can take our best plans and our best visions of the future. And you can meet us where we are and intersect in those moments with us. Write for us new new life, a new journey. And God, give us the kind of the kind of faith God, we, 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 we want to experience that Simon type of faith that's transformative for us, for our families, for our friends. God, we step out today and we will willingly carry those crosses. We stand in awe of all that you are and all that you've done to make us right with you. We welcome you. We praise you. We live for you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Alone in my sorrow, dead in my sin. Lost without hope, with no place to be again. I made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested, my life began. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remained. My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested, my life began. She's over me You have made me new Now life begins with you It's your endless love Pouring down on us You have made me new Now life begins with you Release from my chains, I'm a prisoner no more. You believe me, he faithfully bore. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. The wind was arrested and my life On a criminal's brow Darkness rejoiced As though heaven had lost What did Jesus
love this idea of vantage point. And as we talked about last week, how Barabbas' vantage point was that was my cross. And, and as Nathan got done sharing in his message, that that was my cross to carry. And Simon had that unique privilege to be able to be a part of Jesus' story by carrying his cross to the crucifixion site. And in that moment, that created a life change for Simon that would forever change his story and his family's story as he came to know Jesus in an incredibly powerful way. And this time of communion is, is that same type of experience where we get to get to see Jesus in a very real and raw way because when we taste the bread and when we taste the juice, we are remembering the crucifixion. We are remembering that moment which Jesus gave up his life for you and for me because of the sins that you and I have committed and we will continue to commit. And so as we remember Jesus, as we reflect on Jesus' sacrifice, may we too experience that same life change that he would capture our hearts, that he would grab a hold of our lives, and that we would just follow him wherever it is that he takes us. Norfie, we love you, and we are so glad that we get to be with you today. We cannot wait to see you again next week.